And now we are immediately jumping to our first LCN keynote. And I'm really happy to have him here, Professor Slim Almini. And I don't want to steal you any longer time because we are already running a little bit late because we started a little bit late. I'm sorry for this. Uh, so I just want to directly give you the microphone and we can immediately start with your presentation. Thank you, James. Uh, we'd like to first to thank uh, the organizer for uh, inviting me for this keynote and for giving me the opportunity to uh, talk to an audience uh, that I don't often talk to. It seems that this conference is a bit uh, working on uh, higher uh, layers of communication network than the ones I uh, typically address in my research. So uh, nonetheless, I think it's a great opportunity for me to tell you about uh, some of the work being done by my community uh, in 5G. So uh, this talk is uh, about uh, paving the way towards 5G wireless networks. And it's a kind of a survey talk uh, highlighting some of the technologies that uh, different groups are working on these days uh, towards uh, 5G systems. So before getting into uh, uh, the talk itself, I would like to take advantage of this opportunity to kind of publicize a bit with the, uh, the place I'm coming from. So I'm a professor at the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology, known as Kaust. Uh, I used to say it's a, it's a new university, not anymore. Uh, we have been in operation for the last uh, eight, uh, actually it's our ninth academic year. Uh, we are uh, located in the small city of uh, Thule. Uh, it's, a, it's a university town. It's a one hour drive north of the city of Jutland, second biggest city in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, uh, on the Red Sea side of uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, it's an independent campus. And uh, as I mentioned, it has been uh, kind of uh, launched in 2009. So KAUST is a little bit special. It's a graduate level university. We just deliver master and PhDs. Uh, it's uh, research oriented and uh, uh, essentially uh, attracts faculty and students from uh, all over the world. Just to give you an idea about the, the EE program where uh, uh, I work, we have at any given time about 80 PhD students, uh, 40 master thesis kind of students, 20 professional master students. We have uh, students uh, coming, as I mentioned, from all over the world, roughly Every year we accept 55 students out of 1,000 applicants. And uh, uh, like in 2016, uh, this is where I collect my statistics, our students were coming from 18 countries. So this is our department in electric engineering. We have two tracks, electrophysics, where we have faculty working in two clusters, some faculty working in the area of electromagnetism and photonics, some others work in the area of device and the circuits. Then we have the second track, which is my track, and we have three clusters, communication and networking, control system and vision system. So that was my two minute kind of publicity, just to, give, uh, just to tell you a little bit where we're coming from. And uh, now uh, I would like to get into the heart of the matter and uh, start talking about uh, the topic uh, of this talk, which is uh, 5G. Um, so I, I will start by kind of uh, giving you some background about like this kind of 5G systems and uh, uh, their challenges and some of the potential solution. Then I will maybe spend a little bit more time on free uh, uh, enabling technology where we have been doing uh, some uh, work uh, in my research group. Uh, actually, uh, in the talk itself, or, or I would say in the slides themselves, there are a little bit of extra details that I will not go through, but uh, just uh, for the sake of completeness, I kept them in the slides uh, because I'm, uh, I'm planning to leave the slides with the organizers and in case they are posted that uh, people who would like to see more details can always go back to slides and these details. So you will see me sometimes giving some slides because the intention was not to cover these but just to keep it for record slides. So then I will conclude uh, essentially with some summary of uh, maybe the main uh, kind of conclusion uh, uh, of my talk. So I just start with some uh, kind of vision of 5G. And uh, the way I always want to start is by asking the question, how many of you have a cell phone? And I'm pretty sure that uh, every single one of you is going to raise his hand. And uh, that's kind of one data point uh, to this kind of uh, curve where we see this exponential increase because of the users. 
And if we ask the follow-up question is, how many of you have a, a smartphone? And I'm pretty sure also that most of you are, are, are going on to raise your hand. And this also explains this kind of increase in the amount of lives that are traffic over time. Now, all of this kind of growth in terms of number of subscribers, in terms of data traffic is pushing the capacity limits of wireless networks. And this is not new. Uh, we have seen that over the last four decades. And we have this tendency in our community, both industrial and uh, academic uh, wireless communication and network community, to go with these strategies of like 1G, 2G, etc. So in general, it takes 10 years to kind of uh, establish uh, uh, kind of a uh, generation of system, and then another 10 years to deploy the maturity. So this game started in the 80s, where we start using uh, uh, cellular communication that was 1G, it was analog, it was recruited 14.4 kilo per second. Now, in the 80s, people in their labs, especially uh, as you may know, the GSM group was cooking essentially 2G, which was deployed in the 90s, so 2G was uh, voice communication uh, for mobile systems. Uh, it started with about you know 64 kilobits per second. Towards the end of 2G in the late 90s, with Edge and GPRS, with the introduction of, of course SMS and email capabilities with these 2G systems, were at the level of uh, 256 kilobits per second. Then came the 2000s. Uh, at that time, uh, 3G was deployed, and then we started having uh, browsing and mobile internet. Organization positioning also came into the, into the game. Uh, we were talking about a couple of megabits per second uh, transmission capability with these 3G systems. At the same time, people were working active in 4G, and this is our era, the era of 4G, where we have systems operating at 4 plus megabits per second and uh, essentially enjoying uh, all, all the kind of video streaming that the 4G uh, is providing us. Now, as I mentioned, now is the time in our labs, both in academia and industry, to work with the next generation, which is 5G, which is expected to be deployed for the first time uh, as part of the Tokyo Olympic Games 2020. That's kind of a, one of the deadlines that the, the Japanese have put for themselves, and pretty much you know, uh, others will follow uh, after that. So when you look at 5G, essentially people are looking at the very high expectation in terms of uh, data rate, uh, connectivity, uh, mobile data volume, reduced latency, and we we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, as we progress. So essentially, it's getting better tenfold or hundredfold in all the performance metrics that we have been playing with or using over the last 40 days. So, so this is a typical web graph that uh, we show when we talk about these different generation system. And the way it works is this ITU, part of the United Nations, uh, Union of, uh, uh, International Union of Telecom, that uh, set up the vision in terms of these recommendations. So if you, and this uh, vision comes in the form of a report called typically IMT report. So IMT advanced was the report that set the ground for essentially uh, 4G. And you see like these are the kind of expectation of the vision that was set for different performance metrics. <coughs> now, if you look at uh, uh, the next kind of vision, which is uh, IMT 2020, and 5G is supposed to respond to IMT 2020, you see that there is an increase in all these kind of dimensions. But what is interesting and maybe unique to 5G, in contrast to previous generation system, that people are acknowledging that there is no point to go and improve performance in all these dimensions in the times. There is a kind of consensus that 5G we start seeing a certain kind of specialization. We have what the so-called user scenarios that are going to basically highlight some particular applications. And these applications will have very tight requirement <coughs> for certain performance metric while being lose from other performance metrics. So three user scenarios have been identified as part of this vision. And uh, the first one is enhanced mobile broadband. This is what we have in much, much higher uh, kind of data rate uh, capability. Then we have the massive machine type communication, which is essentially not really about high data rate transmission, but rather uh, extreme uh, connectivity. So it's like IoT++, like the ability to connect pretty much everything to the network and monitor everything in real time. And then 
the third kind of uh, uses value of interest, which is maybe uh, in a way unique, and uh, or we are starting seeing that as part of uh, wireless communication, this notion of uh, uh, having a user scenario emphasizing ultra reliable, ultra low latency communication for certain applications, including, for instance, tactile internet. So these are the three user scenarios. So let me give you some examples. When you talk about uh, enhanced mobile uh, broadband, we are talking about ultra high definition video streaming. 3D video conferencing, uh, virtual reality, so in the future maybe LCN 48 or LCN 50, there is no point to have keynote speaker traveling and coming on the spot. They will be in their offices, there will be high definition uh, you know, kind of cameras, uh, kind of uh, taking, uh, like, uh, taking their picture, and in real time there is a hologram that will be essentially uh, projecting the keynote speaker, and uh, that requires, of course, uh, you know, ultra high uh, uh, rate of transmission in real time, and uh, that's one of the user scenarios that is being emphasized. The uh, second user scenario of interest is, as I mentioned to you, this massive, massive type communications uh, for industrial control, traffic uh, safety, uh, you know, all kind of application requiring some uh, monitoring that may benefit from uh, this kind of uh, user scenario. And the third, and as I said, probably uh, newest uh, kind of uh, user scenario has been identified as part of 5G, is the so-called uh, ultra-reliable and low-latency communication. We are talking here about, for example, uh, autonomous car driving, uh, remote surgery. Uh, obviously, uh, these kind of uh, applications, why they are uh, uh, having these kind of two specific requirements of being ultra-reliable and low latency uh, because you can think of, uh, for instance, uh, uh, when we talk about uh, autonomous driving, that uh, uh, any kind of uh, uh, miscommunication uh, can lead not just uh, to a phone call drop, but it can lead to an accident. So that's why reliability is super important. Also, latency is super critical because uh, uh, you know if you have cars driving at uh, at uh, regular speed uh, and uh, not having real-time information uh, shared between these cars can lead uh, uh, obviously to also to accident. So this kind of combination of reliability and low latency is critical for these kind of applications. And this is an, an area where a lot of progress has to be done. At the physical layer where I work, but I guess at your layer too, where essentially it's super critical to kind of reduce latency. Just to give an idea or a flavor of what we are talking about, uh, my, uh, I think uh, 2G, we are talking about like few hundred milliseconds of uh, round trip uh, latency delay. In current uh, 4G systems, you know, depending on the device network that the kind of core goes through, we are talking an average of 20 milliseconds. The vision or the objective of 5G systems for this kind of application is to have end-to-end -end round trip delay of one millisecond. So it's like a 24 increase in comparison to the best of what we have now. And that's, again, a, a, a really a big challenge for 5G systems. So now, going back to now my roots, which is uh, uh, you know, a physical layer technical engineers, when you look at the wireless communication uh, systems, we always look at, at it from a spectrum perspective. Spectrum is super critical, it's a natural resource, it is scarce, it's being uh, kind of overused in a certain way. People are starting talking about spectrum exhaustion, to a certain extent, spectrum deficit. And, and the reason is that spectrum has been used uh, not only uh, for uh, you know, cl like the classical application of radio, TV broadcasting, and health and industry, but of course, over the last few decades, with the increase uh, of uh, civilian uh, cellular communication for voice, data, and now video streaming applications. So all of these applications are competing for this limited spectrum, which has been kind of limited in the lower part of the spectrum but what we have been using traditionally for wireless communication. The spectrum is much wider, much larger, but we are exploring only the small, lower part of it. Now, we need to fit this 5G vision with all this big one that I just talked about within this limited spectrum. And uh, here is one of the challenges that we have to address. So I would like to go to uh, one of the fundamental equations I, I, I put in my wireless communication class, senior level class, 
uh, I teach or like first year master of the class. <coughs> so we always look at uh, what we call the area of capacity as a good indicator of a kind of a performance of wireless communication systems. So the area traffic capacity is the bit per second over or per unit area or per meter square. So one way to look at it is you can multiply up and down by a node and up and down by hertz. And you can divide this kind of quantity into three parts. Bit per second per hertz per node. That's what we call the spectral efficiency. That's a pipe that we have between two points that are connected wirelessly to each other, or talking wirelessly to each other. Then you have the node per meter squared, which is the number of nodes that we have within the unit area, and that's your kind of metric density. And then you have the last term, which is the the spectrum. So bottom line, if we are having this kind of performance because of air traffic capacity today, and you want to go to this kind of much bigger, much better performance of 1,000 times better, you have to improve in these three dimensions. And these kind of the direction that different research group again, from a physical data perspective, are pursuing in order to kind of explore these different dimensions and kind of improve performance across or along these three dimensions. So let us look at the first dimension, which is the spectral efficiency dimension. Now, the spectral efficiency dimension, you want to improve it or you want to get a better spectral efficiency. So one way to look at that, so first of all, uh, this is, a, of course, a metric that we've been looking at for the last, you know, again, four decades or so. So if you look at spectral efficiency over time and bit per second per hertz, and here time is indexed by the standards. So you see here uh, GPRS edge, 2G kind of standard, 3G kind of systems, and here's 4G. We, we see this kind of continuous increase in terms of efficiency. So we have done a good job. That's something that we have been improving over time, but we still need to do even better. Now, what can we do better? Obviously, you can go back to the charge capacity as a kind of indicator of uh, like a, a different kind of uh, degrees of freedom or the different kind of uh, parameters you can play with in order to improve your spectral efficiency. And essentially, there are three key parameters. There is the kind of uh, front parameter N here, which essentially tells you that you know, the more antennas you can use at the transmitter receiver, the better is a, a physical layer spectral efficiency you can achieve. And this can be done through so-called massive vinyl. So massive vinyl is an acronym we use in our kind of jargon to kind of describe a system with an extremely high number of antenna and the transmitter you see. So that's pushing MIMO system that we're using today to other limits. And uh, that can improve spectral efficiency by improving the disturbance from the result. Now, duplexing, uh, the ability to kind of, uh, you know, kind of uh, download and upload that formation on the same link, on the same frequency at the same time, is another kind of uh, technology that people are exploring. Uh, uh, to improve spectral efficiency. Uh, we, I, I call it this alpha duplexing, and I will define a little bit more down the road. It's kind of a factor alpha between one and two. Alpha equal one is what we have today. Two is kind of the limit of reusing the uplink and downlink frequency simultaneously, which is maybe not a good idea, as I will mention later. But that's one way to improve spectral efficiency. And obviously, the third and the kind of uh, last way to improve spectral efficiency to improve the interference condition or to improve the signal interference to noise ratio. And that's essentially third research direction. So if you if you will, one way to summarize the different research directions that are being pursued at the physical layer to improve uh, spectral efficiency is through a uh, massive minor system, uh, full or alpha duplexing kind of systems and the better interference management scheme. Now, uh, massive MIMO, and uh, I will spend a few slides telling you a little bit what we are doing in this area. So essentially what it is, it is equipping a uh, base station with many, many more antennas. It can be on the order of 100 antenna. The idea is that this can increase the capacity by 10 times or more by making the system more energy efficient, more spectral efficient. Uh, it, you know, it can give you better uh, robustness for noise and then make interference. Essentially, what this will allow you to do is to generate super narrow beams, tensile beams, uh, that will allow you actually not only to do uh, azimuth kind of uh, uh, beam forming, but also elevation beam forming. So if you have people stacked, in, let's say, in a high rise, you'll be able to kind of approach them, or touch them, or connect with them with, two di with different beams simultaneously. Okay, multiplex data coming specially from different uh, 
uh, like altitude without problems with these massive mine water type of systems. But obviously this has been a quite active area over the last uh, few years, but this counts, uh, this capabilities or this potential comes with uh, many uh, challenges, including, uh, you know, uh, this high dimensionality problems reduced to, uh, related to the channel state information has to be collected for all these antennas. Uh, this uh, effect of correlation, and that's something we've been quantifying or trying to characterize, uh, and the impact of correlation on the capacity of these systems, because you know you squeeze these antenna close to each other, we're hoping that they are uh, kind of uh, going to experience independent fading, but in practice, because you have to squeeze them close to each other, they would have to face some correlation, and this leads to a certain uh, degradation in terms of performance, in particular in terms of capacity. Uh, another interesting uh, kind of challenge that led to some, uh, in a way, interesting development is uh, the extreme computation demand uh, on classical recording and receiving techniques and these multiple antenna systems. Uh, actually, there is a nice marriage happening these days, as we speak, uh, between uh, communication engineering and high performance computing. There are people who have been trying to kind of develop uh, decoding algorithms on GPUs, uh, uh, taking advantage of some of the high performance capabilities of these devices to implement uh, much more complicated uh, and, in a way, uh, 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 algorithms with better performance than the one we typically use when we run into kind of complexity problems. We often go into low complexity, but really uh, suboptimal kind of schemes. So people are trying to go close to optimality by going to uh, high performance algorithms, and these algorithms require a lot of complication, and there is like, this need to take advantage of what GPU may offer. And that's why there's this interesting kind of, uh, kind of uh, connection between communication engineering and high performance computing these days. So uh, this is an example, and these are some of the slides that I'll be skipping. Uh, some of the, our research work has been focusing on uh, you know, how to generate these kind of beams in both uh, the azimuth and elevation dimension, and uh, in particular trying to assess the effect of correlation between uh, the channels uh, coming from these different antennas. So obviously, when you talk about massive MIMO system, you cannot put all these antennas on linear array, as it used to be the case for previous generation system, with about 64 antenna or 100 antenna, you are not going to put them on an array. You put them rather uh, in this kind of uh, full dimensional uh, format, basically you have, uh, you take advantage of two dimensions, so you put different ports, every port will have some antennas. And you'll be looking at the amount of correlation uh, that exists between different antennas because uh, the higher is the correlation, uh, essentially the lower is the performance from a capacity or even from a terrain performance perspective. So some of the schemes we developed, and here I will skip on some of these slides, is to try to quantify the correlation between uh, different antennas. And uh, you know, just to make a long story short, we use some mathematical tricks to kind of uh, write this correlation in terms of fully series coefficient of uh, power spectrum density. Uh, you can see that uh, we have a, an exact uh, a quantification of this correlation that is being validated by simulation. So we have some theoretical expression for the correlation coefficient between different uh, uh, antennas. So uh, we are looking at a full dimensional minimal system, let's say an 8 by 8 uh, system where we have uh, uh, 8 port, each port has uh, 8 antennas. And we take as reference point antenna 1-1. One, one. That's uh, the antenna that has the lower part. And then we try to quantify the correlation between the slower antenna and then any other antenna in this full dimensional system. For instance, if you take the antenna 2-2, two, two, antenna number 2 in port number 2, you get the correlation as function of the distance. Obviously, the bigger is this distance between antennas, the lower is the correlation. But the more you want to squeeze antenna close to each other, the higher is the correlation. And then here, as you see, the correlation between antenna 1, 1 and 2, 2 is quite high. Then as you move away, like antenna 2 from port number 4, port number 4 is more far away from port number 1, the correlation decreases, and so on and so forth. So that is a description of the amount of correlation you will experience between antenna located at different ports. And uh, uh, our contribution here, this is what I skipped because I, I felt that you know, it's not really an important part of this presentation, but you can see it from the slides. Uh, essentially, this exact quantification has been validated by simulation, so we have the theoretical results as a solid curve validated by the Monte Carlo simulation, which are time consuming and uh, done via these kind of models. 
Now, why it's important to characterize the amount of correlation? Because there's a big gap. If you assume that the channel is uh, independent, you would be getting this kind of capacity results. Whereas, actually, in reality, the correlation is going to decrease significantly to, or to a certain extent the capacity you will be enjoying. And as such, having an exact or at least a hybrid quantification of the amount of correlation that you see with the antennas will give you a better idea on the amount of capacity you can uh, afford. Now, the second technology that I would like to talk about is the notion of food duplexing. So I'm not sure in this community, like the LCA community, what does food duplexing mean? But in our part, what we mean by food duplexing is the ability to communicate on a downlink and downlink, uplink, simultaneously on the same frequency. Obviously, this was science fiction a few years ago. It is like screaming and listening at the same time. This doesn't happen because we're creating separate interference. But a few years ago, about five years ago, there is this nice paper, a Stanford paper, 2013, ACM came came up with this concept of food duplex radio, the ability through kind of a smart signal processing and also a good isolation in RF hardware to essentially what they call food duplex radio communication uh, technology uh, allow basically transmission and reception on the same frequency at the same time. So this allows you, for example, to have bidirectional food duplex in this matter, or essentially you can have an uplink and downlink with two users at the same time on the same carrier, or you can get around of this notion of uh, uh, so-called uh, uh, half duplex relay. So relay typically uh, when we talk about relaying at least uh, uh, in, uh, in physical layer, we assume that the relay cannot transmit and receive simultaneously because we constrained the much earlier. So there's always a two time stop kind of uh, setup with relay first listen, decode the information, and then transmit. Now, with full duplex relay, actually the relay can both receive and transmit information simultaneously. So these are the kind of uh, all the advantages that full duplex can provide. That's kind of illustration how food to play can either double the capacity if you are talking to two users at the same time, uplink and downlink, or double the rate if you are talking to just a single user that you can uh, use the link for both uh, the forward and reverse communication. Now, one question we asked ourselves a few years ago when we started looking at food duplex radio, food duplex obviously is great from a point-to-point -point perspective. But obviously, when you talk about wireless communication, we talk about the network perspective, and you have to take into account that there are many more than a single point-to-point -point link that are going to interact with each other. So the question we ask ourselves uh, is food duplexing actually good for network communication system? Uh, and in particular, is it good for the uplink? And I would like to emphasize the uplink here, uh, and you'll see why as I present this graph. So this graph includes three figures. The first, and all of these represent the downtown city of London. And here you see what we call an interference map. So the more red it is, the higher is the level of interference. And you see here the interference map for the downlink of the city of London. Uh, now, let's say, with kind of this play technology. And then you have the same kind of uh, interference map only for the uplink. So as you notice, we have less red here than here, because uplink tend to generate a lower level of interference. The uplink interference is coming from mobile unit, transmitted to the base station. They have lower power, so they generate a lower amount of interference as a charge. And as such, sorry, the interference map for uplink tends to be always more friendly than the interference map for the downlink. Now, so that's downlink, that's uplink with current technology. Now, let's assume that we put full duplex. They wait to transmit uplink and downlink simultaneously at the same frequency. Then in that case, we don't talk anymore about an uplink and downlink interference map. Everything comes together into a single interference map because anyway, we're using the same frequency for uplink and downlink. And that's the kind of interference map you get. So what do you notice? This interference map, where essentially full duplex is being used, looks more like a downlink than uplink. Actually, it's even worse in this kind of uh, uh, downlink because you have here combined downlink and uplink kind of interference. So, bottom line, just and if you look at this curve, what is your expectation? The expectation is that essentially downlink 
maybe from an interference perspective will degrade a little bit, but definitely uplink is going to degrade significantly because of this full duplex cavity that we're put in place. Now, in practice, this leads to what? It leads essentially, remember when we talk about the spectral efficiency and just looking at charm capacity, uh, you, you know, yes, the, the, the duplexing factor in front of the log can help you go from a factor of one to a factor of two by using full duplexing, but there is inside the log the SINR. If the single difference to noise ratio goes down to zero, then essentially you, you kill your overall rate. And that's what happens. <coughs> by going from here to here, you'll be gaining the brief log factor, but by going from here to here, essentially the SINR kind of uh, drop is going to completely make your overall rate go to zero. And that's actually what we observe in our simulations. So uh, I will tell you what was the result, what was the solution we found. So essentially, if you put full duplex radio without any kind of uh, careful uh, calibration or any kind of adjustments, essentially the downlink, so this is like uh, what, okay, so let's forget what alpha and alpha folks on this point here, uh, at zero, when alpha equals zero. Essentially, this is the current situation. And uh, uh, when, uh, when, uh, you, 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 uh, the alpha zero is essentially the current situation. Full duplex is alpha equal one. When you go from current situation to full duplex, downlink capacity go by a factor of two because essentially the SNR remains roughly the same, but you have this factor of two gain from the log. However, when you look at the uplink, because of the SNR going essentially to zero, the whole rate goes to zero and you have 1,000 fold degradation up to break. So what we propose actually, as a, as a way to mitigate that, uh, what we call is the alpha duplexing. This is a capability to kind of uh, do full duplexing, but partially, not fully. Instead of like really fully overlapping the uplink and downlink over the whole spectrum, we decided to do an overlap only partially, and then also take advantage of some pulse shaping uh, differentiation between the uplink and downlink, so we use a sink uh, and a sink squared, for instance, uplink and downlink in order to minimize the cross level of fees between uplink and downlink. Now with this kind of tricks, we realize that for alpha equal uh, 0.3, you know, and for this, for just the set of parameters we use, and for a sing sing square kind of differentiation between uplink and downlink, we get not only a gain in terms of downlink, also 30% roughly, but also a gain in, in terms of, uh, uh, so not only, again, not only on downlink, but uplink. So you have a compromise, you don't have like a double of the rate, you get like a 30% increase, but the 30% you see both the uplink and downlink, rather than seeing like a doubling the rate uh, in the downlink and a complete loss in the rate for the uh, uh, uplink. So that was a trade off we were able to come up with. That was some of our initial results actually. Since then, we have been looking quite a bit at kind of other aspects, including power control and rate adaptation in order to improve the deployment of full duplex system into a network of wireless communication setup. Now, uh, some other kind of ideas that have been put forward to improve uh, the level of interference uh, management is this idea of uh, duty, uh, which is the downlink, uplink, decoupling, or uh, uh, de-association. So, current systems typically use do both, which is downlink and uplink, you know, kind of co-location. So, often when you're accessing an access point, both your uplink and downlink is coming from the same, you know, same source or same base station. This uh, paper that has been kind of uh, presented in 2014 for the first time, eventually published in this communication magazine paper 2016, advocated that there is a certain region of the cell where basically actually it is more beneficial to make users getting the downlink from far away base station, whereas to minimize the level of power that they need to transmit, to minimize the level of interference they will generate, is better than send their uplink to <coughs> Sorry, close by small cell base station. So this decoupling is, in a way, they giving the ability for mobile users to connect at the same time at two different base stations: an uplink far away base station and a uh, uh, sorry downlink far away base station and a close by uplink uh, small cell uh, base station. Uh, with this kind of idea, you can show that you can reduce uplink power, reduce the experience, increase uh, the battery lifetime, and so on and so forth. So this, this idea picked up quite nicely, and uh, we have used actually ourselves to 
and, uh, and device to device communication kind of set up too. And we, we, we showed also great gains uh, once, uh, in terms of SNR once this technology is deployed. But of course, this comes also with some challenges of synchronization of information between these different uh, base stations. So <coughs> that was one dimension that I talked about this dimension of improving spectral efficiency. The second dimension is improving or increasing the network densification or network density. So this is kind of, a, I would say, our bread and butter as, again, a wise physical engineers. This has been the case for the past uh, four decades. You know, this has been like making cells smaller and smaller, reusing the spectrum uh, more frequently is like the obvious way to go when you want to basically uh, uh, maximize your capacity over an uh, area. And uh, within this, what you can do, you can use spectrum sharing or going to create the ability to reuse the spectrum uh, allocating some primary user, other to secondary user or secondary user, and allow to transmit as long as you don't bother or disturb primary user or when the primary user are in either mode. You can talk about the cloud run, small cell, P2D communication, all as some of the enabling technologies that are being researched these days to improve or increase the density uh, of uh, the network. So here are like a, a few slides uh, kind of summarizing the, uh, these concepts. Uh, but um, the third uh, kind of uh, dimension that has been of uh, great, I would say, interest over the last years is this uh, kind of going to the upper part of the spectrum. Uh, and this has been a kind of a trend uh, that we have seen in the past generation. But today, when people talk about 5G, definitely there is a big push to explore, you know, like millimeter wave, maybe terahertz, definitely optical power spectrum. So these three kind of upper level spectrum has been explored as a way to kind of relieve or release the kind of spectrum congestion that we are feeling and that essentially is limiting our uh, 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 the deployment uh, uh, of uh, current uh, system uh, uh, or current generation of wireless communication systems. So when you talk about more spectrum, obviously, you know, we are looking at this W factor in the shunt capacity. You can look at CAR aggregation. You know, that's kind of also a very simple concept. We don't look at uh, anymore at just unified continuous part of the spectrum, even if you have a discontinuous part of the spectrum, you try to combine them together and take advantage of that and try to kind of uh, aggregate that spectrum. But the uh, millimeter wave is something that is uh, being researched uh, quite extensively, trying to take advantage of uh, 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 the, uh, that part of the spectrum to deploy, for example, massive minor systems. As I mentioned earlier, uh, when you talk about millimeter wave, uh, the spacing between antennas is at the order of millimeters, so you can really uh, put in a patch, uh, you know, handle these antennas. Uh, and then uh, there is, uh, as I uh, mentioned uh, just a few minutes ago, this idea of going to the optical power spectrum. So uh, when you talk about optical wireless communications, uh, we talk about three families of uh, kind of uh, research being done uh, within uh, uh, this uh, uh, part of the spectrum. So there is, uh, in the infrared part, uh, free space optics, that's ability to connect, uh, let's say, uh, two uh, uh, kind of uh, end points uh, with, uh, with uh, free uh, lasers, as uh, can be illustrated here. There is also visible light communication, light fi I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with that, but uh, I assume that some of you have heard this word before. But for those who need to hear about light fi so light fi stands for light fidelity, you know, in contrast to Wi-Fi. The idea uh, is to use light not only for illumination, but for communication. So in an environment like this, where we have basically LEDs, LEDs are essentially used nowadays only for communication. So you can think of LEDs as not only a source of light for illumination, but uh, a source of uh, information. And this way it can be done, instead of keeping the light intensity constant, you can modulate uh, uh, you know, extremely fast the light intensity uh, uh, in a way that uh, your eye will not be sensitive to this kind of variation, but uh, uh, in a way that uh, a sensitive uh, full detector on the top of your smartphone or your laptop we be able to detect this variation in light intensity and decode the information that we have been encoded in this kind of variation of light intensity. So that's in a kind of a high level what Li-Fi is about. And uh, 
again, has been quite extensively searched in this area over the last few years. And then uh, there is a, another interesting uh, emerging topic, probably uh, it's quite green, still kind of at the early stage, is the UV communication. So that's again part of the optical spectrum, actually uh, the really upper, upper part of the optical spectrum. Now, one of the main advantages of UV is uh, this ability to communicate using optical wave while still benefiting from a non-line of sight configuration. So, I, I assume that uh, uh, you know some of you, when I talk about optical wireless communication, the first reflex that comes to your mind, you know, optical wireless communication. The main problem: you need a line of sight communication. You need, like, to, you know, like the receiver to see the transmitter, and that's not something that we like as wireless from engineers, uh, because we've been enjoying uh, RF engineering or RF communication, where essentially we take advantage of scattering to be. Uh, able to communicate even if there is no line of sight with the different receiver. Now, when you talk about optical wireless communication for FSO, free space optics, indeed a line of sight is required. When you talk about uh, optical wireless communication from a VLC or Wi-Fi perspective, to a certain extent, yes, you need to have a line of sight between you know the light source and the smartphone or laptop. Although people have been talking about super sensitive uh, foot, uh, you know photon counting kind of uh, detectors that are able to kind of detect uh, uh, light even in kind of uh, uh, hidden areas. But UV communication enjoy, uh, like RF, the ability to communicate with UV waves uh, without being an uh, So there has been quite interest to kind of develop this technology, but they can kind of scattering of UV waves. Uh, but uh, obviously there are a lot of challenges from a hardware perspective. Uh, actually recently at Kaust uh, with a uh, photonics uh, lab uh, collaborator we were able to demonstrate uh, uh, to our best knowledge the first uh, few hundred megabit per second UV transmission outdoor and uh, we are pushing that area because we feel that there is interesting potential however there is of course some maybe health issues that one has to explore before we can uh, deploy these and kind of uh, push power to, uh, we are talking about a very small experiment in the order of few meters and if you want to kind of deploy it uh, this uh, in, a, in a large scale, there are some other aspects that we can carefully check before we'll be able to find people. So, but what I want to highlight, uh, that optical wireless communication is picking up quite, quite well uh, as a way to prepare 5G, and there are groups actively working in these three areas. Now, actually, connect to that, uh, with this revival of optical wireless communication, there are two interesting kind of, uh, I would say, direction that people are exploring. One that is not related to 5G at all, but I would like to take advantage of it, obviously, a little bit, is underwater communication. So, and uh, underwater communication is an area that is of interest because there is more and more interest in to underwater exploration, into underwater communication for, uh, for example, monitoring pipelines or uh, uh, oil explorations. And uh, as soon as we start talking about uh, video transmission real time, underwater, you get stuck because current systems are giving you using acoustic kind of systems giving you just like a few kilobit per second. If you want to go and push that uh, to a few megabit per second, one solution is to use a green or a blue laser, which are now available. You can uh, you know kind of design them or even uh, buy them. And uh, again, that's relying on laser transmission in free space, but in this case underwater. And uh, we have been quite active in this area, and that there is now a revival on optical wireless underwater communication uh, that uh, is of interest. But the other interesting revival of optical uh, wireless communication is related also to space communication. And when I say space, I'm not talking about satellite, I'm talking more about UAV communication. So I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this uh, uh, so called Aquila or uh, Facebook project. Uh, uh, the idea here is. Uh, Companies like Facebook and Google, obviously, they have a strong interest in internet uh, kind of popularization or the uh, availability of penetration. Uh, and uh, believe it or not, some statistics mention that uh, between one third to one half of the world population do not even have full access to the internet the way we understand uh, internet or the way we enjoy internet. And the idea is to kind of uh, democratize or make internet more available and uh, even the way internet is deployed in cities, 
uh, with high density of population, economy scale helping to make reduce the cost and make this kind of system work at, at, at a relatively low cost. As soon as you go to suburban areas, an area with a largely populated uh, uh, or low density of population, what works for city doesn't work there, and that's why uh, internet is not available in many remote areas in the world. So one of the projects uh, led by Facebook is uh, to make internet available in these remote areas through the so-called uh, Akira project. Akira, I think in Greek, it means uh, eagle, and what it's about here is about this kind of drones or UAVs. I mean, I mean they are not like really small. We are talking about like uh, the size of Boeing 737, uh, much lighter. It's kind of it, it, all the kind of uh, wings are covered with photovoltaic cells, uh, so that basically uh, these kind of UAVs are uh, kind of. Uh, having the ability to uh, get their power through solar energy and uh, they can stay uh, up there for three months. They are flying uh, at an altitude of uh, 20 kilometers, so it's like twice the altitude of a regular airplane, and they will have a certain coverage area over which they will be delivering internet. Obviously, you need many of them to have full coverage. And uh, when you are talking about many of them, you need to connect them with each other essentially a network. Yeah. If you will, what it is, it's just creating a flying uh, system of base stations. So it's like instead of having a base station on the ground, you're having a base station 20 kilometers above the ground. Many of them have to be connected. How do you connect them you know, uh, while giving them a high direct pipeline or backholing through free space optics? So there is free space optics to connect these UAVs, another free space optics to connect the mother UAVs to the internet. In the earth. So that's another way where uh, uh, optical wireless communication is kind of uh, being used or being advocated for. And that's uh, Facebook the connectivity lab. If you want to Google it, you see that there's a lot of work being done in this project. So uh, you know, if you want, that's kind of a, a kind of a brief summary of what I talked about. So. Our objective is to improve the area traffic capacity. There are three dimensions at the physical layer that are being pursued, pursued sorry, better spectral efficiency, higher input density, more spectrum. These are some of the technologies that we kind of uh, looked at. I would like to conclude by maybe highlighting one interesting research topic that I'm looking at these days uh, with my research group. I'm not sure in this community how many of you are kind of uh, interested in this, but I just that there is something that I want to share with you. So uh, when you talk about optical wireless communication, one important aspect is the backholing aspect. So we have FSO link being used to kind of uh, serve as a, a backhole uh, between uh, different base stations. So uh, you know, when you have network density, it means that you have to increase the number of base stations. And uh, the more base stations you have, uh, the more you have to connect it with each other. Traditionally, these connections were done by copper uh, cables or by fiber optics. But when you start having a lot of them, people are advocating for wireless backhole solutions, so either through millimeter wave or through free space optics. Now, when you talk about backhole, you talk about uh, links that are aggregating kind of communication uh, transmissions that are coming from different users. So the rate is very high, but also the beta rate or the outage should be extremely low because that's a bad core kind of setup. So the idea here is to evaluate the performance of uh, optical links or the millimeter wave links uh, where essentially the probability of error or the R probability has to be extremely low. Uh, obviously, you can do that analytically and we have been doing that over the last uh, uh, two or three decades. But uh, when you talk about uh, optical wireless communication, uh, the performance analysis of these things tend to be quite complicated because we need to take into account shine turbulence, shine scintillation, pointing errors between the receiver, all of these effects that are complicated to analyze uh, in close form or even asymptotically, led to the fact that we need to simulate the performance of these systems. Now, if you want to simulate the performance of a system and that you know upfront that the performance of the order of 10 minus 8 to 10 minus 9, that's the desired performance of the like to see, 
uh, which means if you just go for a naive Monte Carlo simulation, you need roughly 100 times more samples than what we expect in terms of probability saturation. Let's assume that you need a probability error or an alpha which is 10 minus 8, you will need to run a Monte Carlo simulation with 10 to the power 10, if not 10 to the power 11 samples. And that tends to be cumbersome, time consuming, etc. etc. So, one interesting topic that can help is important sampling. Important sampling is the art of running simulations. So it's not close for, it's not analytical or performance analysis kind of work, but running simulations in a smart way so that you get exact result with much less samples. And the art of important sampling, so what it is about, important sampling is about reducing the bias or changing the, the distribution you are sampling from in a way that you are kind of accentuating the errors and then demapping or you know, kind of uh, doing at the end a uh, kind of a, a, a transformation to get the exact problem error or the exact hour problem. So there are many uh, kind of uh, uh, import sampling approach uh, and we have been actively looking at import sampling approach that are valid or suitable for performance of uh, 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 optical wireless communication so, for instance, when you talk about optical wireless communication, one of the well-known channels, so-called gamma-gamma channels, so when you have a turbulence or a scintillation uh, over a, an optical wireless channel, one of the models is being used to characterize uh, the kind of uh, SNR of the receiver is a gamma-gamma, which tends to be a bit complicated to analyze. So, when you look, at, for instance, at the sum of gamma-gamma random variables, different approximations have been used, and most of them, when you go to the 10 minus 4 and below uh, uh, approximation, uh, oh, they use approximation to kind of analyze the system, and most of these approximation uh, fail miserably, actually, in the low or rare advantage. So we developed uh, uh, recently an approach to kind of uh, simulate, for instance, uh, the sum of gamma gamma and variable for important sampling. So you see here in blue, you have a naive Monte Carlo approach. And uh, you notice below 10 minus 6 is start failing, but the important sampling approach gives the exact uh, result. And if you look at uh, the number of samples required, so here, like the kind of, uh, this is an average probability, uh, the threshold is the required threshold. The lower the threshold is the lower uh, the average probability, so it can be on the order 10 minus 10, 10 minus 11. What do you notice? For a naive Monte Carlo, the lower the threshold, the more samples you need to be able to get accurate results. Whereas with the approach, with the import sampling based approach, which is actually a very, a very simple shift. What we did is we shift the distribution in order to kind of uh, kind of uh, uh, increase the tape over which we can sample uh, and then we give up at the end. So basically, the number of samples we use is always fixed regardless of the R probability advantage we have. So uh, we, we did also the same for correlated of normal and environment, which also arise in the context of was communication and again uh, our approach which is uh, a lean shifting approach uh, naive Monte Carlo failed below 10 minus 5 whereas Monte Carlo uh, uh, and more based approach give you often uh, exact uh, results so this is what I want to highlight so uh, I, will leave, uh, I will conclude with this slide that essentially give you a big picture of some of the technologies we use to kind of uh, prepare 5G or prepare the kind of uh, uh, the ground for the uh, different uh, area over which uh, we can do current systems so that uh, we are ready for 5G. And uh, with that, I would like to thank you, and I would be happy to take uh, some questions. Thank you very much. In the beginning, you told us that you are typically visiting confluences looking at the lower layer compared to LCM confluence. But in my opinion, it's really important that all those people here developing the protocols, the network protocols, and network applications of the future know how our future networks will look like. So it's really important to have presentations like you are here. Thank you very much for this. Are there any questions immediately? Over there. Thank you very much for your talk. And towards the end, you mentioned about backhaul uh, issue. So one of the technology people have been exploring is uh, caching for to, to deal with the back, uh, backhaul limited uh, uh, bandwidth available there. So what's your opinion about caching? Is that effective? And is there a potential for it to 
to mitigate this problem. Yeah. Obviously, caching, I think, is very important also. A lot of I mean, put it here as part of my presentation, but uh, there have been people, even from my community, looking at caching. But of course, it is, it, it's important when, like, it's a common event when people are sharing the same files, so the files are only once come to the edge to close by the station and everyone else can benefit uh, close by from this. But uh, there is uh, scenarios where essentially uh, you know, caching will not help because uh, uh, you, know, you need to kind of get fresh information uh, or new information. But, so caching is important, it's an active area of research, but uh, you need also to look at the long term back of work because not all information can be cached. More questions? Uh, yeah, over there. Maybe this is a little stupid question. I'm not so deep into communications and things like this, but you mentioned that you like to have the downlinks, the farther away station than the uplinks. Don't you need there then a lower frequency to, to, uh, to get this gap? What do you mean this far away? Isn't that the data rate lower then? No, uh, what I meant is, uh, you know, when, uh, maybe I wasn't clear enough of this. I meant when downlink is coming from base station, base station can afford to transmit at high power. So it can have a longer range. Uplink is the mobile unit talking to a base station. So you would like to reduce the amount of power. So that's kind of the trick that they're using. It's decoupling, uplink, and uplink is a mobile. Nothing else. So we were talking about uh, high direction and spatial multiplexing. Even doing elevation um, informing, um, and uh, that, that sounds interesting because, on the other hand, you talked about reducing delays. But if you do informing in two di di uh, different dimensions, uh, I assume that there will be, when you are uh, connecting to a moving mobile station, you will have much more handovers. So, this does not really work together with having better, better delay, or is it? So yeah, I mean, uh, there are maybe some kind of contradicting kind of, uh, I would say, requirement. Uh, not everything is going to work uh, for such kind of uh, low latency applications. So you know, this technology, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that we have to use all, but for certain applications, we may use only subset of these technologies. Obviously, when you talk about application where uh, delay or latency is super critical, one has to reduce delay in the air interface uh, in terms of what kind of uh, the massive mind of technology to be used or optical wireless communication which needs to get down to the day. But of course at the higher level where most of the delay is happening, the protocol and, and network and multi-hopping uh, you know aspect has to also take into account that. So you know uh, yes one has to look at holistically at all the environment and then use the proper kind of schemes that will allow you to have low delay if you are looking at the tactile internet or the super low latency uh, requirement. But not all of them are like that, as, as, as I mentioned. It's one question. Over there again, yeah? <coughs> Can I ask you a, a follow-up question on the backhaul issue? Mm -hmm. So you were saying that uh, you are exploring this uh, optical uh, backhaul communication, right? Yes. And then you mentioned that there is a uh, the challenge of high epidural rate there. So is there a possibility of coexistence of multiple backhaul, like low epidural rate and high epidural rate? And we can use high epidural rate for delay tolerant application and low epidural rate for real time communication? Uh, you know, why, why not? But uh, I think usually at least the schema I'm familiar with, when we talk about or, or any kind of, uh, I would say, communication system trying to aggregate multiple links is that typically you have a certain bit rate requirement. But what you can play with is the bit rate, <coughs> like the, the, the bandwidth. So uh, for instance, I'm, I'm trying here to kind of uh, think in real time, uh, you can deploy uh, this backhaul using hybrid FSO RF systems. So for example, FSO, free space optics, are systems that can provide you gigabit per second. Actually, there are big amounts of terabit per second. But they are very sensitive weather conditions. So let's say 95% of the time they can give you a gigabit per second, but then as soon as you start having some fog, some kind of uh, uh, you know like the sandstorm in our part of the world, then essentially you have to start having serious degradation performance. 
and sometimes you can lose your data. So what you can put in place is a backup RFE that we operate at megabit per second that will secure. And still, still the beta rate will be required. You need to have a 10 minus 6, 10 minus 5, and go to a beta rate. But what is going to happen, your bit rate or your bandwidth is going to reduce. You remain connected, but at a lower data rate just to keep you know, talking and, until the weather condition improve, and then you can go back to the episode. So, uh, you know, I think uh, the one that usually, in terms of quality, are not uh, changed, but what can change is the amount of transfer information. So, thanks again. We have an upcoming break, and I'm pretty sure that additional questions can be taken during the break. Thank you very much again. As usual, Nancy and you will get a thank you very much for this certificate of appreciation as well. Thank you very much for being our keynote speaker and we have a small and local gift that's in this way as well. Thanks a lot. Thank you.